Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about pointing. But first, this episode is brought to you by all of the fantastic people who have supported the podcast by becoming patrons or buying merch over the years. We don't work with a big production company or anything. It's just us, and we're really able to just keep doing the show because of your support, both in recommending the show to other people and when you're able to help us financially. You know, I was pretty worried when we were first trying to figure out how to keep Lingthusiasm sustainable. Mm. Like, were we going to have to run ads for some sort of sketchy, learn a language overnight type service? Yeah, we uh, we get some interesting pitches. <laughs> oh, we sure do. <laughs> I mean, I don't think all the language learning platforms are bad. I just wouldn't feel comfortable endorsing them without trying it out for like hundreds of hours, at which point that's mm. not really very cost effective. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of easier to just say no. And if you like that Lingthusiasm exists and you want to help us continue to exist for many years in the future, we really appreciate your support, especially on Patreon. Our most recent bonus episode for patrons was an interview with Martha Tutui Billens, a name you might recognize from the credits of this show. We chatted about her work on politeness in Amami, fieldwork in Japan, and her podcast, Field Notes. To listen to this bonus episode, many other bonuses, and to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Hey, look, this is a podcast. Yes, this episode right here now. Uh, Lauren, no, no one can see that you're pointing right now. Um, yeah, uh, it's a pity because this is one of my favorite types of episodes where we're going to talk about gesture in an audio only format. <laughs> you know, you really picked a very interesting combination of being a gesture specialist in as far as your research goes, and also having a podcast, which is audio only. <laughs> That's okay, because one of my favorite things to do is explain gestures that we do all the time in a whole lot of detail, because it makes you realize how impressive they are. And pointing is one of my favorites of these. So, oh pointing expert, tell us about pointing. Pointing is a very human activity where we use a part of our body and we kind of project out from our body this invisible line towards something and another human is able to look at that point and look at that invisible line and figure out what our invisible line is pointing at and figure out that we're looking at the same thing. And we do this without thinking about it all the time. So we humans do this sort of invisible string, invisible line thing that can be following like a finger or the whole hand or like an eye gaze or several things like that. Do animals do this? It depends on what animals we're talking about. Uh -huh. So apes, our nearest relations, they gesture, but they don't point and they oh. don't seem to get the idea of pointing. So if you try to point to something, a gorilla or a chimpanzee or a bonobo or something is going to be like, I don't know, I'm just going to look at your finger or whatever. Yeah, there's like hundreds of hours of chimpanzee gesture studies and gorilla gesture studies, and they don't point. It's not part of their communicative collection of skills. But dogs are really good at following human points. So dogs don't necessarily point themselves? They don't necessarily point themselves. But if you point to something, they can follow that. And now I feel like I've seen humans try to point at like a treat or something that's on the <laughs> ground for a dog. And the dog is just sitting there looking at your finger being like, I don't know what you want from me. And then finally, you sort of tap your foot by the treat and the dog's like, oh, this. OK. OK, let me. But you're saying that like maybe I should have just trained this dog better. OK, let me clarify. OK. Some dogs seem to do it with very little training. Some dogs seem to take more training but can follow a mm -hmm. point compared to wolves, which are not domesticated oh. and don't engage with pointing. And there is a research paper that says that cats don't engage with pointing either. Wait, do cats just not engage with pointing or do they not want to engage with pointing that they understand perfectly well? The paper doesn't make clear. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. They're cats. <laughs> we can't know what happens in the minds of cats. Um, I have had students when I've talked about non-humans and pointing say that their cat can follow pointing. Okay. So this is perhaps an under-researched area and there may be cats that have this skill. Maybe all cats have this skill and have just decided to withhold it from us. But 
beyond humans, pointing is not necessarily a skill that other animals have. That is kind of fascinating because I think of it as pretty basic. Like a lot of babies can point before they can talk. Mm -hmm. Pointing is normally a pathway to other forms of language and communication. And you can like train animals to respond to particular words, but it's like harder to train them to respond to points. It's because of that magic invisible line between they, they kind of just look at your finger. And in fact, it's weird that we don't immediately just look at the end of someone's finger and instead we look at some invisible line shooting off. I, I, you can't see me right now, but I have my hand up and I'm, I'm pointing at a visible finger and, and there it is. So you said a visible finger. Sometimes pointing happens with like the index finger. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens with the middle finger, with the whole hand. I guess you could point with your elbow if your hands were occupied, or maybe you could point with your thumb if you're like pointing back in that direction. Is there research on pointing with various parts of the body? Yeah, absolutely. We talk about pointing with the finger and particularly the index finger as kind of the most common. And when we were pointing that you couldn't see at the top of the episode, that might have been the kind of pointing you were thinking of, but it's by no means the only way that pointing happens. There are different ways of pointing that are easier in communication. So you mentioned if your hands are full, you might point with your elbow or your foot or a little chin flick. Mm -hmm. When we're pointing at something that's like not a specific thing, but maybe like a group of trees or somewhere far away, we might use an open hand rather than the more narrow line of a specific finger. That's true. If you're trying to try to create an invisible web or an invisible waft of string, I, I don't know if we're <laughs> how the metaphor goes, but yeah, <laughs> trying to paint with a broad invisible brush. If we're pointing to someone or something behind us, it's often easier to just do a little flick of the thumb backwards. Mm -hmm. It's just the shape of the hand makes that yep. easier to do, and we don't think of that as strange. I'm currently pointing behind me with my index finger, and it is very awkward. <laughs> I hope everyone who's listening is also trying out these points. And there's this really wonderful corpus study from Kenzie Cooper Ryder, who a lot of this work comes from because he did his entire PhD thesis on pointing, um, where if you're pointing towards yourself as like a physical thing, you'll use your index finger. But if you're talking about your, like yourself as a identity, as a, as a human embodied living creature with a mind. Okay. Like the mental you, you're more likely to do it with an open hand. Oh, interesting. I was feeling myself doing that as you were saying it. So sometimes the variation is what's easiest for your hands to do. And sometimes mm -hmm. it does convey something slightly different, like I'm pointing at one thing or many things in the distance. Yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes the difference is depending on the culture that you're in and the cultural practices you have. So middle finger pointing, a lot of kids will point with their middle finger just because they're figuring oh, yeah, out it's manual. So funny. <laughs> dexterity. It's hard to wiggle your fingers around and it is very funny, but it is also a common way of pointing in some cultures. There's some really nice work from Central Australia that people will default use their middle finger rather than their index finger. So these would be cultures where the middle finger doesn't have this taboo, obscene meaning that it has for me and a lot of English speakers. Indeed. <laughs> Because that's certainly something that overrides the pointing meaning. I, I have seen some English speakers point with their middle finger, and I'm always sort of giggling. But yeah, people do do it sometimes. Once you notice it, you realize it is more common. We have this idea of default ways of pointing, and things are actually a lot more varied. Mm. Also, eye pointing. Again, Kenzie Cooper Ryder has this really nice paper on Yupno from Papua New Guinea, where people will do this really prominent like gaze and like pop of their eyes towards something as a way mm. of pointing. And lip pointing is a thing that we oh. see, whether it's like the lower lip or both lips kind of purse outwards in Southeast Asia, we see this across Africa. There's a really cute scene in Encanto, which is set in Colombia, where Mirabelle points with her lips towards a gift she wants to give her little cousin. And it's this really sweet moment and a really nice, just culturally appropriate use of pointing. That's great. I think I could do eye pointing, especially if I was like, you know, in a public space and trying to gesture to like, oh, this person has a really cool hat on or something. And I didn't want to like put out my full hand and be like, oh my God, check out that person's hat. Mm, um, and yeah. be like, look, look behind you. There's a person with a cool hat. But I don't think I have lip pointing for myself. 
Yeah, because we get this cultural variation and that's really interesting to see across the world. We also have variation in what it is not appropriate to point at or how it's not appropriate to point. Mm. There's this amazing study that Robert Blust did over the years of collecting examples of cultures where it's rude to point at rainbows. And he collected 124 different examples of cultures where it is taboo to point at a rainbow. So it's like bad luck or something to be like, oh my god, look, a rainbow pointing at it. Yeah, exactly. And these cultures are so spread out around the world that it's not likely to be something that was like a recent cultural story that they all share. It's from all corners of the world. Maybe really ancient or something. That's fascinating. Yeah. I definitely don't have any taboos about pointing with rainbows. I probably always point at a rainbow when I see it because I'm like, oh, great, a rainbow, look. Yeah, I feel more compelled to point because it's so exciting to see one. Um, You may have a taboo around pointing at people. Hmm. I mean, I guess in some contexts... Given that you were just uh, doing a low-key eye point at someone's cool hat, you probably wouldn't like do a big index finger point at someone in public and be like, cool hat. Yeah, I feel like that's especially if there's like a kid and they're commenting on some aspect of the body. Like if they're like, oh my God, mommy, look at that lady's blue hair. And you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like my kid should not be commenting on you. I can just hear the parent voice that's like, (laughs) don't point. It's rude to point. (laughs) Yeah. So this is clearly a taboo I have been taught. (laughs) I don't know that I've been taught so much it's rude to point as I've been taught it's like rude to comment on strangers' appearances in public in a way that they can hear you. But I think it comes down to a similar type of thing. Yeah, because an index finger point in particular is really prominent and visible and very obvious what's happening. And so you can see how that fits in with that taboo. And it kind of says a lot about the name index finger as a term for that finger that we have between our thumb and our middle finger. So that dex in index is from a Greek word meaning pointing or showing. Which is why a index in the back of a book points back to other bits of the book that you might want to read on that topic, or an economic index points to something that's happening in the economy. And you sometimes get, especially in older texts, this like drawn pointing index finger in the side of the book, Mm. which, you know, can point to particular passages, like say, oh, this is particularly important, or this is interesting, people would draw them in by hand, or, or they could be in somewhere to index particular things. And it's also related to a word that's used for various types of pointing things, both gestural pointing and grammatical pointing in linguistics. Yeah, we've called them pointing gestures so far, but the more technical term for them is diectic gestures. Diectic is one of those words that at the same time, it's so useful and it's so cool and it's so hard to say and it's so hard to spell. I have genuinely double checked the spelling several times, even just in the preparation of this show. (laughs) Because you have diexis, which is Mm D-E-I-X-I-S, and then diectic, which is related, is D-E-I-C-T-I-C. So you could say like a diectic word or a diectic gesture. That's just Mm -hmm. the adjective form. And that one's got a C instead of an X. And I hear people say diexis, daixis. Dyxis, like there's all these different ways of saying it. it. It's not spelled like the dex in index. There's an extra I in there. And it's so useful. And there are so many things that are dyktic and I want to talk about it all the time. And yet it's this word that feels very complicated. So hopefully by saying it a lot in this episode, we can point a path toward it being more usable in the future, maybe. Excellent. We do tend to use pointing and diexis interchangeably, but I guess diexis is like the academic term for pointing. Right. And it's useful to have sort of an academic term because there are a lot of grammatical things that are deictic that we don't necessarily think of as being literal pointing. Yeah. So one example is that pronouns are all deictic. So when I say I, I am referring to Gretchen. I am pointing to the I that is me that is Gretchen. (laughs) Oh, that's really interesting because when I use I, I use it to point to Lauren. Right. And the same thing when I say you, well, in this context, I'm referring to you, Lauren, but in fact, I do talk to other people also at other times, and sometimes you refers to other people also. Interesting, because I use you to refer to everyone who's listening to this episode. Well, I can also use you for that. (laughs) Um, And same thing with if I'm saying, you know, Lauren, my co-host, she's done this, or like we, the co-hosts of Lingthusiasm, All pronouns refer to things and people that are dependent on context. And so they're all pointing to someone or something that's in a particular space. 
We have a whole episode on pronouns because unpacking what's happening with these little words that are pointing to different people and different things at any given time, there's a lot happening there that's really interesting. Sign languages also use a specific version of pointing when it comes to pronouns, right? Yeah, they make use of the fact that they are visual languages and they make use of this human tendency to point. And so a lot of sign languages, you'll see their pronoun system, the I and the you and the we, is done through a kind of pointing. So, for example, Auslan and BSL, as the sign languages I know best, will use an index finger point. But even though it looks like an English pointing gesture that you'll commonly use as an English speaker, there are differences. And there's this really nice study that a group of sign language researchers led by Jordan Fenlon and a bunch of gesture researchers, again, Kenzie Cooperwriter's name comes up, uh, work together to look at signed and spoken uses of pointing. Ooh. And you see these really consistent differences as well as these similarities. So even though you see a lot of index pointing in both, for a signed language, the index finger tends to get used a lot more consistently. We talked before about how as an English speaker, you might use a thumb to point behind you or an open hand. In a signed language, because it's a pronoun and it's part of the grammar, the form is much more consistent in how it's used. But it's also a little bit reduced, like the index finger isn't always as extended. It's not as held for as long. It's much more reduced because it is a part of the grammar that people are using all the time. And so it's this really nice thing that shows pointing and signed pronouns use the same resource, but in slightly different ways. My favorite thing about pointing and signed pronouns is from a study in American Sign Language, which studied these two deaf children of deaf parents. And the study is from Laura Petito, so the kids are pointing to persons, objects, locations all over the place. But then they go through this process where they're acquiring specifically the pronominal points where you're pointing to yourself to be me or you're pointing to someone else to be you. And the kids, like how kids who are acquiring English and lots of other languages, sometimes acquire pronouns backwards. Yes. So sometimes you'll get a kid who's like, you know, you're tired. And the kid will be like, yes, you're tired. And they actually mean that me, I'm tired. <laughs> they're tired. They haven't figured out that I means Lauren for me and Gretchen for you. They just think you is the reference for them. Right. And it makes a lot of sense because they don't have that context to like, no one is actually saying, okay, the thing you need to say is I'm tired. <laughs> you just have to infer they haven't that. figured out the pointing element of the pronouns. Yeah. And the cool thing about this ASL study is that the kids do this same you pointing reversal. Ah. So they're making the pointing you to refer to themselves. That is super nifty. Isn't that cute? <laughs> I love that the research you cite also reinforces that pointing in signed languages is much more grammatical and like pronouns, but it is heaps cuter than the example that I had. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's very cute, but it yeah, exactly. It reinforces how it's really grammaticalized because they're aware that when they're pointing to, you know, the dog or the cake or something, that they're pointing to that object, but they interpret the you point as grammaticalized to refer to themselves, even though it's literally not pointing to themselves. Huh. Excellent. I'm so delighted there's a parallel. And it's like the same ages as when hearing kids get this correct around 25, 27 months. Because again, this diectic function that feels really simple and we think of pronouns as like a really basic thing that you acquire early in any language that you learn is actually something that is, in terms of thinking and cognition, really, really hard. Right, exactly. Another really common type of diectics is words like this and that and here and there. Mm -hmm. If I say something like, put that over there. Uh, put what over where? <laughs> exactly, because these are contextual. You can't see what I'm pointing at. You can't see that I want you to pass me the cake. Also, I'm not putting down this cup of tea quite yet. <laughs> but I want this. <laughs> um, and this sort of highlights like pronouns are basically inherently deictic, but there are lots of other categories of words that can be used deictically or not. Mm -hmm. So if we have an example like I love this city. I'm going to assume you mean the city that you are currently in, right. which is actually not the same city that I'm in. <laughs> exactly. This requires knowledge of my current location. If I say, I went to this city one time and I saw this amazing cat or something, that's probably referring to a specific city, but it's not 
identifying it anywhere there. It's more like I went to a city, which doesn't identify it contextually. Yeah. And in fact, I assume it's not the city you're currently in. In fact, it's true. If I'm telling an anecdote that way, I went to this city one time, doesn't mean I went to this city one time. It would be very weird. Yeah. So English has basically two levels of closeness. So we have this and here, which is something that's close to the speaker. And we have that and there, which is further from the speaker. But we used to have yawn and yonder. Indeed, we did. Peasant, fetch me yon book. (laughs) And carry it yonder. I feel like it's sort of oldie timey. It definitely does sound oldie timey, and it means something that's not as close as here and not as far as there. No, it's further. It's It means like over there. Oh, okay. It's so old, I don't even have a sense of what it means. <laughs> right. Yon and yonder is like over there, which we still sort of have. It just takes two words. But there are some languages like Spanish has esta or esto, which is close by. Esa, which is sort of a medium distance. Sometimes the middle one is also used for stuff that's near the hearer or near the recipient. And aquel, aquella, which is like over there, sometimes also used for something that's neither close to the speaker nor the hearer. Huh. Useful. I love having more distinctions than here and there. I love it when I learn a language that has that. Right. And there's lots of these languages. Serbo-Croatian has it. Korean, Japanese, Thai has it. Turkish uh, has this three-way distinction. People from all kinds of language families realizing you need more than a here and a there. Right. And then there are a few languages that have even more fancy systems. Oh, excellent. So Sinhala, which is an Indic language spoken in Sri Lanka, Mm -hmm. and it has a four-way system. So near the speaker, near the addressee, close to a third person, kind of visible, Mm. and then far from everybody, sort of not visible. Right. I don't know what you do with a sort of complicated situation where you have something that's like far from everybody, but it's still visible or like, yeah, visible, but close to, you know. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure someone has a very good experiment you could use to tease out those distinctions. Right. But there is sort of a four-way distinction that gets further and further away. Yeah. And then Malagasy, which is an Austronesian language spoken in Madagascar, has a seven degree of distance system. Oh, how satisfying. Yeah. Plus two degrees of visibility. So good. Do you think it has anything to do with the fact that Malagasy is right near Africa, but it's actually an Austronesian language, most of which is spoken in Asia? Like, do you think that they just needed all those distances (laughs) to to account for To refer to their distant cousins over in, like, the Philippines and Indonesia and places like that? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I do not think this hypothesis is going to hold up. I, I don't think so. But, you know, they did have a very sophisticated navigational system by the stars. I don't think this is also a reason why... I think Austronesian languages do have a good tendency towards nice systems of distance like this. Yeah, there are tons of Austronesian languages, and it seems like a lot of them have relatively interesting DEXIS systems, which have lots of different levels. So that's neat. Excellent. Spatial systems are really handy because they show us something important about DEXIS, and it's where the pointing is happening from. So for something like Sinhala, The fact that you have something that is the speaker versus something near the addressee or near to a third person, it means that the center of where the diaxis is happening from is different in all of those contexts. Right. And this shows up a lot when we're talking about prepositions and how they're deictic. Hmm. So a lot of prepositions like near and far. So if I say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go get some bubble tea. It's right nearby. You're like, Gretchen, that's not near me at all. I live on the other side of the world from you. That's because we're treating you as the diactic center, and Canada is a long way from Australia. And so the diactic center shifts depending on who is speaking, because that's how pointing works. Right. And if we're saying something like across, like if I said the library is across the street, Mm -hmm. by default, that means it's across the street from me. Yeah. But I could also shift if I'm talking about, you know, maybe we're going to make plans later, and I say, well, it's great because the library is just across the street from the restaurant. And then we're shifting the data center to the restaurant, even if I'm currently on the same side as the library or something like that. Again, once you begin to pull apart what's happening with Diaxis, you realize just how much brain space is going to making sure that you understand what's being pointed to, what the diactic center is. Yeah, what's being pointed to and from where, which is the diactic center. Or if you say something like the dog is in front of the house, so now you're taking the perspective of the house. 
uh, houses seem to have a sort of intrinsic front to them, or at least we feel like a house has a front to it. So the house is the didactic center. But if I say the dog's in front of the tree, and trees don't really have an intrinsic front, now I'm probably referring to my position in terms of someone who's looking at the dog. The problem is that trees don't have front doors, and that is a problem with trees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are some verbs that are deictic, just to keep going down our list of parts of speech. Okay, yeah. So lots of different parts of speech can be deictic. What are some deictic verbs? The biggest ones are go and come. Hmm, yeah. So if I say I'm going to Australia, that's my deictic center in Canada where I'm like, this is a thing that I am heading away from my perspective. Yeah. But I could also say I'm coming to visit you in Australia and then I'm taking on your perspective. And saying, oh, from your perspective, it will be coming, and therefore I can say it in that way. Yeah, that's true. And similarly with, I'm coming home now, I'm projecting my deictic center onto whoever I'm talking to. Oh, home is a good one, because home varies depending on who is talking and also the like size of what is home. So like if I was meeting someone at a bubble tea place, saying I'm going home now would mean to my specific residential address. But if I had come to Canada and was going home, home would be Melbourne or the whole of Australia. <laughs> right. <laughs> and when you're traveling, sometimes your like, friend's house that you're staying with or your hotel room or something, you're like, oh, I'm going to go home for a nap. And that can just mean like wherever you're sleeping that night. You're going all the way back to Canada just for a nap <laughs> and then coming back to Australia in the morning? Wow, that is dedication. Yeah, that, that is true. Home is Home is really quite portable sometimes. I also really like when you hear people's like voicemail. Uh, I don't know how often people are leaving voicemail messages anymore, but on their voicemail, they often say something like, I'm not here. Please leave a message. But like sort of by definition, anywhere that you are currently right now is here for you. So saying I'm not here means like I won't be here when you're calling me to have received this because definitionally if I were here, I would have picked up. But because I haven't picked up, I'm not here in the time that you're listening to it, even though I am definitionally here, wherever I am is here when you're saying it. I can see why people don't actually leave this as their voicemail message recording. I feel like this almost made sense back in the old days where you physically recorded onto a tape that had a specific location. But now people's voicemail is connected to an inbox on the internet on a mobile phone. Mm. What even is, what even is here? <laughs> what is here? <laughs> I don't know, but you can also use Dixis to talk about time. What even is time? I was thinking about this at the top of the episode because we always say today we're talking about. And indeed, we are talking about this today, the day that we're recording this, and you are De definitionally at the moment of recording that moment is today. Yes. And you are absolutely listening to this today as it's being listened to or that you're reading it as a transcript, but they're two different todays. They are two different todays. I was very conscious about this when I was writing Because Internet, which is a book that I wrote about language on the internet, because I'd read a lot of other books and articles about things to do with the internet. And a lot of them would say things like now or currently or modern. And so you read something like MySpace is very cool now, and you flip to the copyright page and you go, ah, this came out in 2006. Oh, wow. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trying to be more specific and say, like, this is cool in the early 21st century, or this is cool in the 2010s, or this is what people were doing in the 90s, or like various eras, rather than saying now, because I was very conscious that like, people would hopefully read this book from the future and go, oh, no, we don't do that anymore. And I wouldn't be able to predict which of those things would be the case. Very aware of what now means. Thinking of the internet also reminds me of just how terrible it was when MySpace was cool now, because <laughs> MySpace, the my in MySpace is a dialectic pronoun. Oh, yeah. And- uh, you'd you'd have to be like, uh, follow my MySpace, or what's what's your what's your MySpace? <laughs> Do you have a your space? <laughs> it was very tough. <laughs> and there's a lot of these that are named like my something, and you can see how you would sort of do this as a user design, and yet as an actual user, you're like, no, this is very frustrating that I have like my courses or my account or like my network, and you're like, okay, so log on to your my network. I feel like I've seen both things like my bank and your bank, because it depends on how the people setting up and naming the system thought about it while they were creating it. And they are terrible to call up and ask for help with. 
It's like, I'm, I'm having trouble logging into my your bank. <laughs> yeah, it's like, is the bank talking to me or am I talking to the bank? And either way, maybe we could just not put something dick dick in the name of this product and all of our problems would be solved. The problem with affixing a diactic center to a name that then is actually a shifting center. Right. Causing all kinds of diactic anxiety. And I think like time decks is, is especially prone to this issue. We're talking about something like now or soon or then, mm -hmm. yesterday, today, tomorrow. And like you can see why we use them because it is super useful to me like the day that is currently. And like you and I have like time zone issues a lot of the time mm -hmm. because we obviously live in different time zones. And so we actually use dyctic time more than absolute time because it's easier to say, do you want to talk in an hour? And we can both just add an hour to whatever our current time is rather than do you want to talk at seven o'clock? And we're like, well, I don't know what time it is for you. Well, even today becomes a problem because we're across the international dateline. So my today is often your tomorrow. Yeah, I have to think about this really hard. <laughs> So, in fact, when we're recording an episode on both of our todays, we are, in fact, recording it on different days, even though they're today for both of us. True. <laughs> there, there is actually almost never a single today for an episode of Lingthusiasm. This gets us into the gigantic this next problem, which I feel like makes its way around popular discourse like every couple months. Yes. So if I say, like, when is next Monday? Next Monday is like three days away for me right now. So I would say next Monday is like the one that's three days away. But if you ask me when next Saturday is, I don't think it's tomorrow. Mm. I think it's the one that's eight days away. And so sometimes people use next to be the one that sort of wraps around to another week. So like by Monday, it'll be another week. But next Monday and this Monday for me are currently the same day. Yeah. But because it's Thursday for me right now, this Friday and next Friday are currently different days because this doesn't wrap around the week. Yeah. And it's always the closest one. Next wraps around the week, but it could still be the closest one if that closest one has wrapped around the week. I have just taken to never using next <laughs> as a day of the week unless I've absolutely clarified the absolute day of the month as well. And there's the same problem with like last May, like when does this summer become last summer or like if it's only October, mm. is last summer the one that happened two months ago? Or is last summer the one that happened like a year and two months ago? Again, the seasons one made even harder by the fact we don't even share a hemisphere. So we can't even point to the same season at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the English language was truly not designed for instantaneous communication across uh, literally the entire globe. Or writing, like all of the diactic time and diactic location in writing. We should just abolish writing and distance <laughs> communication, and that will make diaxis so much easier. <laughs> this sounds like a terrible world, and I don't want to live in it. You're right. <laughs> we need to evolve a more fanciful and elaborate type of diaxis that works around the world and in writing and in lots of time zones. It is a testament to human cognition that we are able – to do diaxis when we have diactic centers split across days and across places and across times in this way. The other thing that I was thinking about with diaxis is like, okay, you know, nouns can be diactic, verbs can be diactic, adverbs can be diactic, pronouns can be diactic. You have a sentence like, the cat is purring. Like the the there also picks out a specific cat in a way that's context dependent. Yeah. And like my idea of what a cat is, is based on my history as someone who has had a lot of cats pointed out to them. For sure. So is meaning just dykesis all the way down? Like everything you just learned through a combination of things that were pointed to? I mean, yeah, I think maybe it is. I find this like a kind of fun and interesting way of thinking about meaning because the way that I think we're sometimes introduced to meaning in a formal context is through like dictionary definitions that give you like a description of a cat mm -hmm. that says something like, you know, a cat is a furry creature with four legs, long tail, purrs, whatever other attributes you want to assign to a cat. But in practice, I didn't learn the word cat by looking up in a dictionary or having a description provided to me. I learned the word cat by having a bunch of cats pointed out to me. And sometimes a cat has three legs or is one of those weird hairless cats. I've never looked at a Manx cat and gone, that cannot be a cat. It doesn't have a tail. <laughs> right, exactly. And you could say, like, okay, they all have cat DNA. But like, I have petted so many cats in my life. And I have never done a DNA test before I'm like, ooh, kitty. 
Oh, yeah. I uh, I said to my neighbor, I was like, I'm not going to feed your cat until I get a DNA test to prove it's (laughs) definitely a cat. Uh, Then I'll feed it. (laughs) So, like, that's not how meaning works. It's like, it's not like humans couldn't talk about cats before they had DNA tests. Yeah. (laughs) And so we did a whole bonus episode about, you know, meaning and the ways that we interact with it, talking about the is a pizza sandwich meme, Mm -hmm. which I would highly recommend because I think it's a very fun bonus episode. And it turns out that this is actually how meaning works for most people in context. Like you see a bunch of examples of cats or birds or chairs or whatever. You come up with a sense of what's in the cluster based on generalizing from those examples rather than by having like an exact list of parameters because some stuff is an exception to those parameters and it's still, you know, a point in the cluster. Absolutely. And especially for things where we can point to examples of them in the world. Right. And one of my favorite responses after we put that is X a sandwich episode up was someone saying, you know, this makes me feel a lot better about not having a really clear definition for what it means like to feel like a woman. Hmm. Because it turns out all words work like this if you look at them long enough. It's less like a list of criteria and more like situating yourself within a constellation of other points. Yeah. You just meet a bunch of women over the course of your life and you're like, do I want people to say women when they refer to me also? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, both, yeah, that's how I feel about being a woman. And uh, yeah, language is all about pointing towards meaning. It's pointing all the way down. (laughs) Gretchen, can I finish by telling you one of my favorite jokes about diexis? You have a joke about diexis? Okay, I absolutely need to hear it. Two linguists walk into a bar. Which one is the expert on diexis? I don't know. Which one? This one. Lauren, once again, this is audio. Oh, well... That's okay, because now we're at the end of this episode. I'm pointing to everyone. (laughs) For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things pointed to in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get Etymology Isn't Destiny on t-shirts and tote bags and lots of other items and aesthetic IPA posters and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. And my book about internet language is called Because Internet. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include interviews with Sarah Dapirella and Martha Tsutsui Billens about their own linguistic research and their work on lingthusiasm, and a very special Lingthusi ASMR episode where we read the Harvard sentences to you in a calm, soothing voice. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Villains. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!